uh, and there's also a database, an access database that goes with it that uh, shows biographical uh, discographical information. Um, so there's an immense uh, amount of data in here with regional coverage of the entire South, uh, some historical span, uh, of course limited by the fact that this is uh, song lyrics. And again, I've, I've brought a, a sample case that you can put this on, please, in the form that uh, it exists in the database where you have some tagging and formatting conventions that need to be observed in transforming something like that into an electronic corpus. Um, and the next page suggests uh, what you can do with this by means of software. The, the top part uh, is the overall composition of the database, the various pieces of information that you can get from that, how they are linked. And the bottom part is a uh, standard concordance, uh, as you can see this properly, it uh, shows there are 265, I think, instances of start to in this corpus. And that's uh, a very nice way of studying the possible complementation pattern. As in this case, for instance, you find start to rolling, start to crying, and whatever it is, which is, I think, an interesting complementation uh, pattern. So that's the methodology, essentially. Uh, table one on page three of the handout compares both corpora. Uh, one is, as I said, white, uh, uh, represents white English, the other one African American English. It's letters as against uh, song lyrics. Uh, the size is quite different. Historically, the blues corpus represents, let's say, something like early 20th century data from African American English, uh, whereas the plantation overseas corpus represents essentially early 19th century uh, white data. But the interesting point for our purposes is that both uh, represent relatively informal kinds of uh, Englishes. You see this? All right. A uh, couple of exemplary uh, analyses. Uh, just to show you what can be done. Uh, you have uh, the data in your handout. First one is verbal inflection in the white earlier variety. Uh, as table two suggests, uh, this is pretty much what we would expect, I guess. It's essentially a third singular ending. It is very common in the third plural. It does occur at times in the first singular and, and very rarely in the second persons. Uh, fits in with, with what we know about this variety, especially the fact that in earlier varieties of Southern English, especially the verb in, uh, S ending was uh, particularly more frequent than it is today. The subject type constraint that's been documented very widely and then for the first time in African American English by my friend associates in another lattice paper uh, 11 years ago is also very effective in this context, quite clearly as the table at the bottom of page 4 shows you. This is a uh, a comparison of a sample that Michael and I published years ago, as I said, in the full corpus of an analysis done by a student of mine, Regina True, uh, and it shows the uh, subject type constraint to be in full effect. There is a tendency to have an S ending after a full noun subject, as in the worms continues in example one, as against uh, no ending after a pronoun they, as in example two, they have destroyed, and so on. And, and the figures bear this out very nicely. Uh, uh, percentages are very clear in that case. The second uh, type of effect is, is also very strongly visible in this context, the non-proximity to subject constraint. There is a tendency for the S ending to come up in earlier Southern Englishes if the verb is not directly adjacent to the subject, as in the three examples which I quoted here. Uh, Negroes are, or blah, and has been, well, I have finished the crop and has delivered, and so on. So the S is on the second of these, but not on the first ones. And in three different grammatical persons, table four also shows you that this is borne out very neatly. The percentage of S's in the non-adjacent position is considerably higher than uh, in the adjacent position. Uh, the second example is early African American English, and um, illustrating a couple of structures which I think are interesting and should be worth further consideration. Um, one is familiar, I think, for two infinitives that goes back to early modern English and historically has been documented well. But uh, here it does occur not only after verbs uh, as an independent clause, but also as a complement to nouns and adjectives. I stop for to rest, there's no way for to treat me too old for to shift all of these from those lyrics. Um, the second example is the one which I really find interesting because to my knowledge it hasn't been systematically studied and certainly is worth further consideration. Um, uh, bare infinitives for ing infinitives, uh, ing forms or two infinitives would be expected keep everybody awake rather than waiting. Uh, you heard about the wall fall. Uh, I don't want the woman walk 
the road rather than walking. Uh, I want you to take it easy, not to take it easy, and so on. And the third one is the same category that's on the next page, two plus verbal ing for it. It does come up very frequently in earlier African American English texts. Uh, historically, as I know, it hasn't been properly studied, but uh, there must be something to it. Present day varieties probably would expect an infinitive here to begin to think and start the motor to running, starting to dancing. The long table on pages six and seven compares non standard verb forms. Um, on the basis of three sets of data, early 19th century white, that's the plantation overseers, black, that's the slave narrative that I studied in an earlier work of mine, and 20th century black, that's blur. And as you can see, all the major types of non-standard verb forms, regularization, zero forms, uh, confusion of past and past participle forms, and all these are documented very widely uh, this you'd have to go into, I think, in, in more detail to find something that's also very strongly lexically constrained. Uh, but the documentation, I think, as such for earlier morphology is, is quite very, very valuable. Uh, there seems to be a, a larger degree of regularization and invariant forms um, in blur, blur uh, I think, if anything. The next category suggests a couple of perfective structures, and, and, and now I'm proceeding to comparisons of both black and white. Structures, so these sources you find in both uh, varieties. One is uh, forming the perfect with B, also a gender and traditional grammatic type pattern that's been documented widely. Walt showed it to be systematically grammaticalized amongst the Lumbi. Uh, and here we find it uh, in fairly recent times, actually. It seems to be, have disappeared from non standard English elsewhere a little earlier than that. Lavinia is gone, Cordy has come up, uh, he has run away. The woman is tamed, I never see, and so on. Then we have this three verb pattern, which earlier I claimed is the source of perfective done in the South, where done is supplemented by a preceding auxiliary that gives you tense marking. Uh, so in this case, something like uh, the cook is done, gone mad, uh, is for tense, done for perfectivity, and then you have the verbal construction. And the last uh, structure that I think is interesting is the use of periphrastic did with past reference, now, reminiscent of Caribbean Creoles, where you find that in Mesolithic varieties quite commonly, um, not used for uh, emphatic purposes and not for habituals. That would be a different story, but it's simply one way of expressing the past, and in some varieties this is extremely frequent, and again, as, as I see it, it hasn't been studied systematically. Uh, I did think you did one, I did make a mistake, uh, the whistle did blow, and then also there's a couple of cases with the past participle following in the blur corpus. Uh, they sure did treat it in dirty. The last point I'm trying to make uh, relatively briefly is uh, the corpus is also there to show you, to face the well, difficulties that you weren't expecting in a sense. Uh, there are structures in there which defy the neat categorization that you usually build on in such mythological frameworks, and that way forces you to rethink your descriptive categories to look very closely in order to understand what's going on here. Uh, this is also a selection from ongoing student work of mine. Uh, we're looking into patterns that probably are left, left dislocation, double subject kind of structures, and whether she does something. Uh, and that's the intention here, but uh, it's not quite clear whether that's really what we find. Uh, we're all well, but Saki, she's very poorly. The Negroes is all well, only Maria, she's been in bad health. Uh, all are well, except John, he has typhoid fever. There's no punctuation, there's no sentence boundaries, obviously. So there's no real way of telling what the syntactic interpretation of that could be. Could be uh, double subject constructions, left dislocation constructions, obviously. It could simply be coordinate main clauses, so that the second clause begins uh, after the noun phrase. Could also be something like relativization with personal pronouns as relativizers, which we'll also find in some varieties of rather simple but well-documented kind of relativization. So you do encounter fuzzy boundaries, and then you have to develop principled ways of analyzing structures like that, compare it to related patterns to see what's going on here. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping as I was asked to uh, help to have shown you that the combination between corpus linguistics and studying the history of Southern English uh, is an interesting avenue of research promises new possible insights. Thank you for your attention.